Excellent. Welcome, everybody. My name is David Jones. I'm the faculty of Glo the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, and I'm delighted to welcome you all for our second in the special seminar series that the department is hosting this fall. In addition to our long-standing seminars, the Wednesday seminar series that Scott Podolsky organizes, and the Friday morning medical anthropology series organized by Mary Jo Byron and Mike Fisher, we have launched this pro seminar in social medicine as a forum for our faculty and our community more broadly to explore our vision of what social medicine is and should be, with an eye on en engaging key topics of great urgency today, whether it's COVID, health equity, or the pursuit of race justice, and many, many more. I hope that many of you heard Alan and Paul speak three weeks ago, and we have a terrific lineup for the rest of the semester and continuing into the spring as well. Now this week, we are fortunate to have another, another terrific pair of speakers who have done crucial work in social medicine working in, particularly, in particular at the, at the intersection of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, the Division of Global Health Equity, and Partners in Health. Both of them are well known to most people here, so I will be brief in my introductions. Joya Mukherjee came to Boston to complete her residency in medicine and pediatrics at Mass General Hospital and then pursue a fellowship in infectious disease. She quickly began to work with Partners in Health and in 2000 became the chief medical officer a position she has now held for two decades. In that role, she has worked to provide comprehensive, high quality healthcare for people on four continents, from Russia to Rwanda, Peru, and the Navajo Nation. She has also devoted herself to teaching. In 2012, she became the founding director of our Masters in Medical Science and Global Health Delivery, and has now led many cohorts of students, most from medically underserved communities, through two years of study and research at Harvard Medical School. It is our hope that these students will become the next generation of leaders of global health and social medicine. Joya has also published an important text on global health delivery with Oxford University Press in 2017 and has won many awards for her work and likely deserves many more. Our second speaker will be Michelle Morris, an internist at the Brigham and Women's Hospital who is dedicated to the pursuit of health equity. She has also held important leadership roles in Partners in Health, especially in Haiti, and in the Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. In 2015, she co-founded the Social Medicine Consortium, an international organization dedicated to activism and, dis and disruptive pedagogy. She has, also important, she has also pursued important research, for instance, working last year as part of a team that unmasked race disparities in cardiac treatment at the Brigham. Since 2009 and currently, she has held a Robert Wood, Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship in Washington, DC. Assigned to the House, House Ways and Means Committee, she has been a valuable ally and actor. For instance, converting a small piece of research that I had done on the role of race correction into congressional in, in, investigations that have now been launched by both the House and the Senate. I'm deeply appreciative for the work that she is able to do making these connections between the research we can do here at Harvard Medical School and national health policy, which she can orchestrate from her position on the Hill. Her work has also been recognized with many awards and prizes and demonstrates the full range of work in social medicine from clinical care to teaching, research, advocacy, and activism. Just as an administrative detail before turning it over to Joya, we will be recording this session or we are recording this session. Please turn off your video if you do not want that to be shared, especially during the discussion when the full grid of participants will be visible. And for that discussion, we will use the raise hand feature in the participant list if you have a question to ask or wave your hand in your video window and try to get our attention. Uh, but I expect that we will have both excellent presentations and a lively discussion to follow. And so I will turn it over uh, to Joya Mukherjee. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, and I'm so pleased to be here with Michelle. I just wanna honor how busy she is uh, as part of the staffing uh, for the House Ways and Means Committee. And there's no important work right now. And so thank you for Michelle for taking your time. Um, I wanna reflect on the United States failure to address COVID and what we can learn uh, from it for global health. Um, I have reflected for a long time on the disparities uh, um, uh, along the lines of race in the world. Uh, and in my view, racism underpins the large majority of not only disparities in 
health outcomes, risks, and access to care, but our acceptance of a world that is very fragmented. So when I look to social theory um, and ways to understand, I have uh, come upon a few scholars that I want to talk about today. And I just will start with this quote from Toni Morrison uh, on an interview with Charlie Rose, uh, asking her why she doesn't write for white people. I have had reviews in the past that accuse me of not writing about white people, as though their, our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze. And as I'm reflecting on this COVID-19 pandemic, um, Toni Morrison's voice is ringing in my head because the color of COVID is undoubtedly black and brown, is undoubtedly poor. And for those of you who are lucky enough to hear Mary Bassett last week uh, talk about uh, the statistics and the epidemiology of COVID, you know this to be true. But what worries me uh, here in the academy is that the epistemology of pandemic preparedness is wrong. Uh, when we think of the study of pandemic preparedness and what inputs of knowledge are put into it, it is rooted, first of all, in a belief in science. It is rooted in leadership that views lives as we're saving. It is rooted in accessibility and equity of testing, care, and treatment. And the inputs, we're told, are sufficient for systems of care. And lastly, and very importantly, the epistemology of pandemic preparedness is rooted in the idea that the populace will act with civic mindedness. And based on these ideas in 2017, late in 2019, this Global Health Security Index was published. Um, and here is the link to the website if you're interested in looking at it. Um, I think it's notable that the three parties that published this were the Johns Hopkins University, an elite university much like our own, the Nuclear Threat Institute, which I think is a fascinating conflagration of health and war. Uh, and if you think about, you know, what is the take of threats? Uh, and then the Economist Intelligent Unit, not Unity, uh, of the e Economist magazine. So the interest here from the elite institutions, mechanisms that are fighting warfare and, uh, and capital uh, are, are stark. Uh, in this, they came up with this framework, which some of you have heard me talk about, the idea of prevention, detection, rapid response, health system compliant with global norms, and a risk environment. And this is what we were told it are the inputs for pandemic preparedness. Based on that, in late 2019, this Global Health Security Index score was published by this group. And this is something that Salman and I have talked about for years. There's zero accountability uh, among institutions when they put these things out and are proven to be so dreadfully wrong. Uh, here you see the United States was ranked first in the world uh, in a number of indicators, including epidemiologic workforce, biosecurity, emergency preparedness, and planning. Uh, of note, uh, Belgium, which has been quite hard hit, was rated in the middle of the pack, the United States at the top, as I mentioned, and here is Rwanda at the very bottom. And I, I, I think there, there are at least one or two of my colleagues from Rwanda on the phone today. So I'm gonna, just gonna break down for you, and some of you, again, have heard this before, you know, some uh, comparisons between these three places, right? The country of Belgium, the state of Georgia, and the country of Rwanda, all about the same size, all around 10 to 12 million people. Um, the first 30 days of COVID, so arguably the response, right? The response, the rapid response, because we know that controlling pandemics depends on our rapidity. How many doctors per capita? with Rwanda even after HRH only having 0.1 per thousand population, and how many COVID cases from day zero to day 30 of COVID entering into this space. And you see that Georgia with um, 283,000 cases now is completely off the charts. You'd have to do a logarithmic map 
uh, to deal with this. Um, Belgium uh, failed to contain, and Rwanda has continued to little by little contain this epidemic and keep their people safe. So who are our people? So what my first critique about this pandemic preparedness is the idea of who are the people, who are the vulnerable. We see that essential workers are mostly black and brown. They are people who are on the front lines of things like food delivery, mass transit, home care. We also see that we have extreme vulnerability on the bottom right-hand corner, we see a parking lot in Las Vegas, Nevada, where the spaces are supposedly six feet apart for the homeless people to sleep on the pavement. I was almost gonna contain a clip from Childish Gambino, This is America. This is America. And I think that when we think of what pandemic preparedness is, we undoubtedly need a new social framework who is harmed by COVID? And again, many of you heard Mary's fantastic presentation, Mary Bassett, but we know that there's at least a 3.5 times higher death rate for black Americans than white Americans, that black indigenous and people of color are more than 50% of essential workers in food, agriculture, industries, commercial and residential facilities and service, and nearly 70% of essential workers do not have a college degree. 70% of the health workforce are women, and this is because so many of the low-wage home care providers are women. So one question I have is, who does the epistemology? Who puts together the inputs for learning? We know that less than 3% of faculty in academic medicine are Black, that 22% of academic faculty uh, with tenure are women, and that preparedness frameworks do not include political economy of our fragmented and for-profit system, the impact of racism on risk, accessibility, quality, and outcomes of care, and the massive economic inequality we face. I also think it's important to point out the notion of interest convergence, uh, an idea within critical race theory posited by Derek Bell, um, which is that it is in our interest as elites, as non-Black Americans, uh, as people who have jobs and places to stay, that we develop our pedagogy on the basis of a set of sterilized facts. And so this framework of global health security comes out of those steril sterilized facts because it is in our interest. It is easy for me to social distance. Everyone comments on my beautiful plants and my beautiful sunroom in my home. But that ease is not there for so many essential workers, unhoused people, and people who are on the periphery. So I'm going to look at two frameworks to discuss our failures in COVID, but also the where to go. First is the concept of critical race theory, which is to understand and challenge the structures of racism and harm, the social construction of race and its uses to maintain white power, the intersectional methods of analyses that are used within critical race theory, and this idea of interest convergence, who benefits. The second, I will look at black feminist theory really as a way forward the um, importance of oppositional voices, those voices, those theories that are forged in real lived experience, that we center our relationships and care, that we have intersectionality and look at race and class and gender, we look at queerness and other things that put people on the margins of society, and that we link this pedagogy with activism, and again, include intersectional analysis. Um, lastly, of course, we cannot forget that the overarching things, thing that draws these two threads together and underlines our failure in COVID-19 in the United States is political economy, which is how social and political theory and reality intersects with monetary power and economics to influence situations. It is clear that the, uh, the normalities of the racial construct in the United States have a political economy. They benefit capital. They benefit white supremacy. 
and they benefit patriarchy. And so if we don't look at the economic benefits in these situations and the power dynamics, we cannot understand our abject failure to control COVID. So uh, first I'm going to, sorry, use uh, some uh, four different social theories to look at this. Um, I'm of course a big fan of uh, Professor Kleinman's paper on four social theories and global health. And I wanna add these four as I think about what I have learned from this pandemic in the US and from controlling and caring for the sick, controlling disease and caring for the sick around the world. The first is the concept of necropolitics, which was put forth by Ashil Mbebe, which is the extension of the idea of biopower, but goes further into the dehumanization and denigration and death of populations. The second is this notion that com compartmentalization is needed for racial domination, and that comes from Fanon. Uh, then going forward, the, op the need for oppositional knowledge and knowledge that is forged in facing oppression, which is based on race, gender, and class, that comes from Patricia Hill Collins. And then finally, feminism as a framework for mutuality and care from Bell Hooks. First, I will talk about necropolitics uh, from Ashil Mbebe. The idea that Mbebe puts forward is that normative theories of democracy assume reason, that reason brings us to truth and the struggle for sovereignty, and that politics is the exercise of reason in the public sphere. I think that any of us living in the United States and those of us who are not and observing can understand that our democracy is now led by people without reason. They don't believe in science, they don't have reason. The other idea in his sort of uh, critique of these normative theories of democracy is that people participate as free and equal individuals capable of self-representation. Again, we are not seeing this with the election upon us. Massive voter suppression is going on, but it's part of a long thread of historical um, uh, uh, and purposeful uh, denigration of black voices. And Bebe's concern, and this is a concern that I think many of us share, is that what if rather than struggling for truth and sovereignty, the central theme of a government is the material destruction of human bodies and populations. And using the idea of a state of exception and enmity to govern. And I think we are seeing a state of exception ever since the Gulf War. Uh, certainly since 9-11, we have been operating still under a state of emergency, starting a, an office, which by the way, for the younger people never exists called Homeland Security. It sounded laughable when it was first put forward. Um, and this state of exception is being completely even further carried forward and exaggerated by President Trump when he talks about quote unquote democratic run cities, uh, when he talks about um, saving the suburbs, we used to call that dog whistle politics in the United States. It is clear that it is far beyond a dog whistle at this point. It is shouting racist um, epithets uh, at the population as uh, for political power. So I believe that we can see, and if you look at the forced sterilization of women that we have heard about historically and now most recently in, in Georgia, not surprisingly was an African-American woman who was a frontline health worker who broke that story uh, in ICE detention, um, who, who was uh, witness to that on, on women who were in ICE detention. Um, these are forms of necropolitics and again, as we think of pandemic preparedness, we have to assume that leadership wants to save the population. And I think we have to assume something different. There are three important forms of violence linked to, to Mbebe's notion of necropolitics. One is the founding violence. And we are all living in that founding violence, whether in the United States, the founding violence of genocide of the Native Americans, the founding, whether in uh, Latin America and Africa, uh, Asia, the founding violence of colonialization um, and the destruction of indigenous lives. Secondly, the legitimation, 
the, the self-interpreting language to justify the mission, and we see this so much across the many centuries of the United States. And lastly, where we are now, the maintenance of authority through violence. And uh, there are so many examples, but I think most poignantly, we move from slavery to Jim Crow to mass incarceration, um, all of the same thread to control uh, and incarcerate and maintain uh, black folk in, in prison. So these are state sponsored terrorism and they exist actually within a continuum because even though I presented them as founding and legalizing and maintenance, they're ongoing. The existence of per perpetual injury, it is the same families uh, that have gone through uh, these different stages and continue again. The existence of freedom without, uh, uh, without existence without freedom or suffrage, maintaining people in an altered state of citizenship, and the lack of institutions, democratic institutions that support people uh, who are marginalized. Um, we know that necropolitics uh, exists in the fact that the United States is the only developed country without a federal healthcare system. We know that from the time of enslavement, there was no interest in keeping slave, enslaved people alive other than for work purposes. Uh, Post-emancipation, what has not been well studied uh, until recently was that at least 25% of the emancipated people died of starvation and illness because there was no system of care, that Jim Crow and continued racism changed life expectancy. And Nancy Krieger has done some interesting work on this, uh, saying that Jim Crow and continued racism were more or less the same in the North and the South. That mass incarceration is a way to deny people rights. And that insurance uh, African Americans face on average 12 years without insurance over their lifetime. And as ACA comes up, as different discussions came up during the New Deal, uh, during the GI Bill, that African Americans were systematically excluded from those, and many posit that this is why we don't have a broader federal healthcare system. So I want to talk a little bit about the notion of colonialism in space. Um, and uh, Homi uh, Baba, who was on the call last time, uh, uh, who's written so much about Fanon, uh, says this is making a certain uncanny re uh, return to the present. So the idea of keeping people in spaces isolated as a form of social control, as a form of reservation of resources, and uh, uh, as a way to divide the world into two, this is necessary in the colonial project. And I would say we still have a colonial project. And uh, this picture, which is not from Fanon, in fact, is of Trump golf course in uh, Palm Springs, Florida, excuse me, Palm Beach, Florida. And right here is the Palm Beach County Jail. So when you have the coexistence of spaces of wealth and spaces of denigration of humanity, you are creating a system that will be highly unequal and that is meant to be highly unequal. These are not accidental pairings. Um, you know, I think that the idea of space, of course, is best seen in redlining. Uh, the, the, we were founded in violence of stealing people from their land and stealing land, uh, that we legitimize the theft of land. Uh, through Jim Crow, terror, people having their, uh, being thrown off their land, and through redlining, which was a Southern concession to both the New Deal and the GI Bill. So in other words, we could give people low-cost mortgages uh, in the GI Bill, but not African Americans. So the idea of African Americans owning property continues to be a non-starter politically. And so this uh, is a picture from Ta-Nehisi Coates's Cates for Reparations in the Atlantic in uh, 2014. Um, and then maintaining the authority through violence, which is targeted on the very neighborhoods, the reservations, if you will, that were created by redlining, 
in terms of over policing the war on drugs and the school to prison pipeline because remember um in the united states schools are paid for by property taxes this is some work that i'm doing right now looking at redlining in san francisco oakland berkeley and boston this is uh san francisco oakland berkeley on the left hand side you see the the Hulk score, which is the Housing Opportunity Lending Corporation. This was part of uh, the way to create the middle class and districts were redlined. Number four is the undesirable, undesirable districts. You see most of Oakland over on the left uh, in orange uh, and parts of San Francisco. That was being done in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And today you see the um, percentage of COVID in these communities. Now, I saw Molly Frankie on the phone. Thank you, Molly, for helping us with this. It's a little tricky to analyze this, though it's jumping out at you as quite obvious. But for many of the uh, most heavily redlined communities, there has now been, quote unquote, gentrification. And so places like Oakland and Berkeley are facing, and San Francisco, huge populations of unhoused people uh, and so and meanwhile areas like in the northern part of san francisco are being gentrified uh quote unquote gentrified in other words white people are owning land uh, and property so the question for me when i think of this pandemic preparedness theme is for whom is theory written and what Patricia Hill Collins proposes that that theory of all types is often presented as being so abstract that it can be only appreciated by a select few. Though often highly satisfying to academics, this definition excludes those who do not speak the language of elites. Um, and so I want to break this down into where we can learn from. So one of the things that Patricia Hill Collins talks about in her treaty, treatise Black Feminism is the idea of deconstructing the knowledge of who is an intellectual, whose voices matter. And she talks a lot about the production of oppositional knowledge, that conscientization, the lived experience, the enlightenment that one goes through by living the reality versus ab academic achievement may be an important point to start in the construction of knowledge. Um, and then the second, it, she talks about the idea that there's a web of social control. It's not one thing, and this is why we need an intersectional analysis. When you look at black women's suffering in the United States, you see exploitation of labor from enslavement to domestic servitude, political oppression in terms of voting and public office. Remember that Kamala Harris is only the second African-American female senator um, in the entire history of the United States. And then the ideologic representation of black femininity, which I think many of us know quite well. So just to give an example of what oppositional knowledge can teach us about uh, um, intersectionality, one could look no farther than Sojourner Truth, who was uh, a, an un, quote unquote uneducated woman who in fact in her public speaking talked convincingly about the convergence of race, gender, and class. She challenged the masculinist bias of not only the academy, but the world itself. That man over there, she says, says women need to be helped into carriages. No one ever helped me into a carriage. And what Sojourner Truth was talking about is that black femininity was not considered um, needing of assistance, but in fact, uh, part of a burdensome, uh, you know, world of burden. And uh, yet she herself was a strong woman, she was a mother, she had raised children, and of course, uh, grown up in as an enslaved person. Um, and then last, I'll uh, talk about bell hooks, and then I'm going to turn to how these theories can fit with our practice of social medicine. Bell Hooks says, in patriarchy, men are raised to suppress emotions, seek power, and resort to anger and violence as acceptable forms of behavior. Feminism is an alternative social system defined as a movement to end sexism, but instead of an ethos of violence domination, feminism 
promotes an ethos of love and mutuality. So we shouldn't have these gender norms uh, of violence and care, but we do, and they continue. And I'm not, of course, saying that all my male colleagues on this phone are violent and aggressive, but I'm saying that the system of patriarchy is violent and aggressive, and it needs to change for us to get our way out. So what if we had love and mutuality instead of systems of domination and power? A different framework would emerge. Here is Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, the mayor of Atlanta, saying systemic racism and healthcare inequities continue to ravage our communities of color. The color of one's skin or zip code should not determine the state of your health or the length of your life. That sounds a lot like Verkau. Uh, this is Keisha Lance Bottoms. She's talking from the lived experience as an Atlantan, as a former police officer, and currently as mayor of a city. She had a mask order early on, and her first order of business was to provide economic housing assistance for people in Atlanta, support for utilities, and the expansion of testing. And she was sued by Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, for having a mask order. So we see that the power dynamic by this governor against a black woman who was mayor of a city, who was doing what she needed to do to take care of people. This was not about restricting of liberties. This was about centering care. Um, so I'm gonna talk just a minute about the work Partners in Health is doing and how this is informed. Some of you have heard uh, talks about this. We stood up the Community Trace and Collaborative on April 3rd of 2020 to help the state of Massachusetts deal with uh, the COVID epidemic. We said we were doing contact tracing and yet, and from day one, uh, both Paul and I were there with the governor. We said, make no mistake, contact tracing is about care because there is no way that any person of color any person who has the lived experience of oppression in this country would think just someone surveilling if they have symptoms or not is a safe thing. But in fact, we do know that COVID people are vulnerable. And so we have led our response with care and uh, I'll tell you about our COVID care coordinators in a second. What we see is that for people to get access to testing, to treatment, uh, they, they have a variety of concerns housing concerns, water, food, transportation, uh, access to healthcare, uh, and et cetera. And so we realized that this journey, and for our ma master students here, many of you will study the journey because we know from our phenomenal physician uh, uh, anthropologists that understanding this journey, the daily lived experience is central to how we develop programs. These resource care coordinators spoke, speak 23 languages. They are from and work with in local communities. And their job is to understand, can people isolate? Can people get the tests or the care they need? And if not, accompany them. The kinds of support they have provided included food. And by the way, up to 12% of people in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts needed food support other support from diapers to um, you know, transportation, housing, medication support, PPE to take care of loved ones at home, a large variety, thousands and thousands of people were helped through this program. On the phone the other day with uh, a former head of the CDC, uh, we were queried, why does this have anything to do with contact tracing? I mean, this is what experts are saying because they have been framed in a false pedagogy of a logic-driven white supremacist approach that doesn't center care of the vulnerable. Someone else on that same call said, I wish that people would use their $600 from the government as a kind of rainy day fund in case they get COVID. Not understanding that people can't pay their rent, that they cannot eat. And so this lack of understanding is built on this framework of technocratic, scrubbed white supremacist logic that is not related to what we see on the ground. Here is uh, our uh, master's in global science graduate, uh, Alex Miemann, who served as a, a COVID care resource coordinator. 
And he said to the Boston Globe, I was able to arrange for $7,000 to be transferred to this family from members of the community to have a dignified funeral for their loved one. We created a platform for different members of the community to step up and help their neighbors. There was a sense of mutuality here that was not only trying to get support from the government, but building community uh, as a central tenant of care. We're also working with the coalition of Immokalee workers to advocate for testing uh, and hiring of community health workers. This is some of our team. Uh, now, Dr. Frene Leond is living in Immokalee, another graduate of the master's program in global health delivery and helping to support these community health workers to do, to, do, um, to, to help people stay safe. I don't even wanna say contact tracing. And for Ferney, I know it's been a, a big eye opener, uh, the level of poverty in Immokalee, Florida. Um, I think leadership has centered the most eff uh, affected in this, uh, in this pandemic. This is Mayor, Newark Mayor Ross Baraka, who we also work with, placing a moratorium on evictions. And Dr. Mark Wade, who uh, is in the back here, who is the director of the Department of Public Health, rented two hotels to house all the unhoused people in the city in the first weeks of the pandemic. So that kind of centering of the most affected is a critical part of a feminist response. And these are two men doing this response. And then lastly, of course, we need public, uh, we need reparations as a public health priority. And for those of you who haven't yet read Mary Bassett and Sandra Belia's excellent article in the New England Journal, she talks about, they talk about the black white health disparities really being related to historical injustice and oppression, even right here in Boston. So in conclusion, I would say the knowledge of pandemic preparedness through an objectivist lens, which is built into structures of patriarchy and white supremacy has been proven to be wrong. And that without analyzing the inherent racism, patriarchy and political economy of space and health, we can't understand the spread of pandemics. And we must look to repair harm, seek operational, uh, oppositional knowledge and center the affected if we want to be quote unquote prepared. Reparations are morally necessary. And with that, I will turn it over to my friend and colleague, Michelle Morse. Thank you for that, Joya. What an incredible, incredible synthesis of um, four thinker, well, more than four, but, <laughs> but specifically for thinkers who have helped many of us to um, deconstruct systems of oppression and from Mbembe to Fanon to Collins to Hooks, um, what better intellectual uh, ancestors and, and contemporaries for us to, to reflect. Um, to reflect on and, and to explore. I, I really, really appreciated um, the presentation and, and it calls us to ask big questions. Um, and, and my hope is that that's kind of what some of the dialogue will be. I'm just gonna share a few reflections on, on Joy's uh, thoughts and presentation. And then I believe we're gonna open it up for, for more dialogue and more conversation, which uh, I'm sure everyone is, is bursting uh, at the seams to, to get into because uh, again, there's a lot to chew on in, in what Joy uh, presented. Um, just a few of the questions that immediately came up for me uh, in, in Joya's presentation. First uh, for me was kind of how does the discipline of global health and the discipline of social medicine, how does it relate to and practice intersectionality? And Joya started off talking about critical race theory. Um, and as, as many of you know, uh, one of the tenets of critical race theory, uh, though the, the quote unquote father of critical race theory may be Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw, who really developed uh, the sub theory of intersectionality really helped many of us uh, to understand uh, how our actions can and cannot make connections um, between systems of oppression and, and movements. Um, and so it, it made me really wonder, well, how does social medicine, how does global health relate to intersectionality as a, as a uh, part of social theory as well? And how do we do that in theory and how do we do that in practice? Um, and if we're not seeing global health as, or social medicine as disciplines that must bring in intersectionality or somehow relate 
uh, explicitly to intersectionality, why not? What does that mean? What does that represent for us? Um, another thought or question that came to mind is just, uh, and, and this is brought up again by, by the four plus uh, uh, thought leaders and intellectuals that you referenced, Joya, but um, it also made me wonder, well, you know, how do we talk about, how do we think about in social medicine and global health, who gets to speak for you and who gets to define you? Um, and, and how does that impact both how we define global health and social medicine, but how does that impact how we practice and how we do the work that we do? Um, and then I also thought lastly, just in terms of questions um, about how ableism and disability justice can be useful um, as critical lenses for our work in social medicine and in global health. Uh, and uh, I know that many of you have been thinking about that deeply and, and thinking also about how the academy advances ableism so explicitly. So what does that mean? And, um, and how do we upend that? Uh, and how do we how do we react to that? How do we how do we think about that? Um, I just wanted to offer a couple of reflections on the four main thinkers and intellectuals that you referenced, Joya. First, thinking about Mbembe's work around ne necropolitics and how you used it to um, deconstruct the Global Health Security Index. Uh, it just made me think a lot about metrics, uh, certainly about accountability, yes, but just about metrics, period. Um, and it made me think a lot about the work that's been done to upend metrics uh, or typical metrics. So um, I'm thinking specifically of the social mission score, which Fitzhugh Mullen and others uh, published about years ago, that instead of ranking uh, medical schools based on the US News and World Report, which as you all know, ranks things like NIH funding uh, and, and many other aspects of, of quality, um, but doesn't really integrate at all anything about inequity um, or, uh, or underserved care, care for the underserved rather. Um, but the social mission score instead looks at, well, what proportion of your graduates go into primary care? What proportion of your graduates from your medical school are people of color? What proportion uh, are, are working five years later in underserved communities? Um, and when you look at the social mission score as a metric, you see that actually the US News and World Report ranking for medical schools is completely flipped on its head. And the top schools are actually, you know, Howard University, Morehouse School of Medicine, uh, uh, Drew, uh, Charles Drew University out in LA, uh, Meharry, et cetera. Um, so the historically black colleges and universities that are medical schools are the ones that are on top if you use the social mission score. Similarly, some of you have probably looked at the Lown Index that came out not too, not too long ago, uh, ranking hospitals as well. And they use civic engagement, uh, as well as metrics around health equity as uh, the components of their score. And of course, yet again, you get a completely different list. So the reason I, I mention that again is just, uh, it, it reminds us of how important the metrics are. It reminds us of how metrics like the Global Health Security Index that are truly in, in so many ways white supremacy at work because you look at these metrics and you see who's at on the top and it's all of the white institutions on top, all of the black and brown institutions on the bottom, and yet it's, it's considered objective and scientific and accurate. Um, and, and so I think that, that those metrics, uh, again, that encode white supremacy um, have to be reexamined. And I'm so glad that, that you used Mbembe's theory of necropolitics to do that. Um, similarly, you, many of you, at least some of us on the, on the Hill, and I want to mention, of course, that I'm, I'm speaking in my academic role and not for the Ways and Means Committee by any means. These are all <laughs> just Michelle's reflections. Um, but, uh, but thinking about unemployment metrics, right? And, and when you look at unemployment metrics in the traditional sense, the current rate of unemployment in seven, is 7.9%, 7 which doesn't sound terrible. And this is again in the US. Um, but if you look at other metrics of unemployment, um, I'm look at, thinking specifically of the Ludwig, Ludwig Institute unemployment metric, it's 26% actually. Um, if you look at it using full employment and a living wage as part of the metrics, because people who are working for a few hours a week are not actually counted in the traditional unemployment metrics. So again, um, those metrics matter, right? They are the goalpost in such important ways. And when they encode white supremacy, they don't serve our 
interests and goals in social medicine and in global health. Um, I also want to flag, of course, the, the thoughts about uh, scientific racism, and David Jones mentioned this in, in, the, in the introduction, and, and Joya talked about the lack of a federal health system. Um, if you look at how scientific racism continues to shape how clinical medicine is practiced, and again, uh, the metrics and clinical algorithms that David Jones and his colleagues uh, really spoke and, and wrote so clearly about over the summer, really, again, describe how the metric actually gives more resources uh, or raises the risk and concern for white patients over patients of color. And what does that lead to? And how is that connected to racial health inequities? I think there's lots more of work to do in that realm. Um, and then also just, the, uh, again, the lack of federal response, the lack of, um, uh, I guess what I would call uh, inaction in the face of need, as, as Kamara Jones describes it, that inaction is, is explicitly clear in programs like Medicare, where uh, if you look at my community where I'm from in West Philly, the life expectancy of Black men is 59 years, right? And so uh, Black men in West Philly are spending their whole lives paying into the Medicare trust. And most are not on, av on, on average getting to cash in on Medicare because they're dying before the qualifying age. So what does that mean in terms of a federal health system and in terms of a federal response and how does it respond to and how is it responsive to and not responsive to um, the needs of some of the communities that have been left behind or marginalized. Um, I have to, of course, also just lastly on the on the Mbembe uh, points around necropolitics mention, of course, how racial capitalism helps us to understand a lot of this um, and and how important it is for us to recognize, especially again in global health and social medicine. And this is one of the central tenets of what we're trying to do in our social medicine consortium global campaign against racism is understand how, uh, well, some people would say racial capitalism is redundant and you don't need to add the racial at all, right? It's just capitalism. But how does that um, system both connect with necropolitics and connect uh, again in with um, uh, uh, an explicit uh, white supremacist, uh, white on top, black on the bottom, lab system of labor, as well as a uh, health system. So for um, the Fanon con component, uh, I'm not going to get too in depth. I know that folks are going to want to start to have dialogue and questions. So I'm, I'm going to try to go through these other reflections quite uh, briefly. Um, but just this idea, uh, again, as, as of compartmentalization as essential to oppression, I think many of us, especially the, those of us who uh, spent most of our, our upbringing here in the US have thought a lot about the shifting definitions of race over time. And there's a lot of uh, attention being paid right now to the demographic shift that's expected in 2040 or 2050, depending on who you ask, uh, that the US will no longer be a a white majority, but will be quote unquote minority majority. And what does that mean in terms of politics, in terms of interests, in terms of the racial and social hierarchy in this country? Um, what is that? What are the implications of that? And again, I think this idea of compartmentalization um, and, and that framing helps us to really take that a step further and think about, well, you know, we've got race as a category, we've got ethnicity as a category. And for Latinx communities, uh, many of them may decide that they're, they're not going to check the, the people of color box, and, and many don't already. Um, and so how does that, again, hyper compartmentalization by race and ethnicity, how does that serve political needs of the dominant forces and the and serve the needs of, of the current racial hierarchy um, and what are the implications of that for us as we uh, in the US at least prepare for that potent you know quote unquote shift in demographics. I think it's also an important um, aspect uh, that Mbembe covers actually. He, Mbembe's book, Necropolitics, spends quite a bit of time reflecting on Fanon um, and, and on what he has offered um, as a theorist for us to understand the different tools that we can use um, to upend these systems of oppression um, and, and talks quite a bit about um, uh, Mbembe uh, reflects on Fanon's work around how racist contexts uh, like the US system 
give us this opportunity, excuse me, not give us, create and, uh, and, and represent an opportunity to actually truly disfigure um, instead of represent and how the fight to be human, the fight to define oneself, the fight to um, self-determination and autonomy um, in a racist context is profoundly complex because of that. And again, advances this idea of compartmentalization, um, particularly when you don't even get to decide how you are projected and represented in mainstream culture. For um, the last two pieces around Collins and Hooks, the reflections that I had were really about um, one of the most important sentences for me, at least in, in my reading of some of Patricia Hill Collins's work. Uh, she talks about black feminist empowerment and she talks about black feminist thought also, of course. Um, but she says, I now recognize that empowerment for African-American women will never occur in a context characterized by oppression and social injustice. A group can gain power in such situations by dominating others, but this is not the type of empowerment that I found within Black women's thinking. Um, and so she talks about and describes how Black feminist thought is inherently intersectional. It's uh, by design uh, intersectional. And that part of that be comes from the fact that Black women have often been in positions where they are outsider within. They're in an outsider within location and how that um, outsider within position um, fosters new angles of vision on oppression and, and creates a whole new lens uh, with which to deconstruct how oppression works. And she talks about Black women as domestic workers in the Jim Crow era as one of the most powerful examples of that and, and representations of that outsider within position. Um, it made me think a lot about what that means for me as a Black woman in academia and in predominantly white institutions and, and what an outsider within location for me personally has meant both in my global health work and as well as in my, my social medicine work um, and what lens it offers to me that is actually uniquely powerful, uniquely empowering, uniquely um, useful and, and important. Um, and so I, I really appreciated you bringing in Collins. And then last but not least, I think, uh, sir, <laughs> Certainly, certainly, certainly not least. My reflections on your um, joy of bringing in of Bell Hooks um, and, and her descriptions of, of feminism as uh, mutuality rather than domination. And, and I loved how you applied that to um, PIH's work in contact tracing and in implementation work, right? Like the, the dialectic of, of actually like taking this, these theories and, and doing the, the right political work with it um, to address material needs of, of people all over the world. And it made me think about what uh, a community led and community owned system of contact tracing could look like. Like how could these principles be applied to actually create not a partners in health led contact tracing program, but truly a community owned, community led uh, contact tracing program. And, and the principles that of course came to mind for me immediately were self-determination, um, certainly mutuality, and that's already ingrained as you described so beautifully, Joya, in PIH's contact tracing sim uh, system. But also it would be a, a community led, community owned, completely community autonomous program of contact tracing would also be affirming of humanity. And it wouldn't be about uh, surveillance or state surveillance in the same way that a lot of the current programs are. Uh, I don't see that in PIHs, but I've seen that in many others. Um, the narrative of what those contact tracing programs would be would be owned by the community and shaped by the community. Um, they would do, the community would do the media and the PR and the, and the talking points and uh, the interviews and the descriptions of it. And perhaps most importantly, the metrics for the outcomes of that program will be determined by the community as well. Um, and you could also imagine how this kind of a system that's compute, completely uh, community determined and community developed could also lead into solutions to the vaccination <laughs> issue that all of us are hearing about constantly, right? I think it's now, at least in the US, up to I think 49% of Black people are saying that they would not get the vaccine at this point. Um, and so again, how could that kind of a 
a system, again, a, a completely community owned system of contact tracing. Um, what could that look like? How could those principles that you described uh, by those four intellectuals joy be brought into that? And how could it actually build the frameworks that we need for an effective vaccination campaign? Um, so thank you again, Joya, for, for setting us up for such a um, expansive and challenging conversation. I really, really, I learned a tremendous amount. Uh, and those are just a couple of the thoughts that came to mind for me. So I think, am I turning it back to you, David? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Michelle. That was just such a phenomenal analysis. And I also just want to say that, um, you know, one of the reasons that Immokalee and Newark popped up for me is that it is really, in both cases, the community itself that's leading. Um, and, I, and one of the things we've seen with these progressive Black mayors that they are really speaking on behalf of their community in a very different way. Um, so, and in terms of the coalition of Immokalee workers, that is indeed a very grassroots organization trying to um, do what's right for people. So yeah, thank you so much. That, that was fantastic. Okay, so we have a hundred people on the call. I suspect everyone will have a lot to say, and I'm certain that Michelle and Joya will have much to say in response. So I, I don't think we can promise that we will be able to get to everyone uh, or that Joya and Michelle will be able to answer their questions in full detail. Uh, but let's take a crack at this and see how it goes. I think the simplest thing to do to manage this will be for people who have questions uh, to use the raise hand feature. Uh, and uh, we will then call on people to try to orchestrate this. Maybe people are shy, David. They can just write it, write their question in the chat. Too. Yeah. Also, as as I'm looking at this, I do not see that I have a raise hand feature. I'm not sure if the participants do. Oh yeah, they're not there. So, anybody who's a host or co-host usually doesn't have it, <laughs> but other people should. I hope. Okay, it sounds like people do. So I'll, I'll ask one question while... Uh, oh, Jean-Claude Jean -Claude just raised his hand, David. Okay, sure. No, 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 no. I, I was just looking to see if I have it. Apologies. <laughs> Joya, could you actually imagine implementing the community-based contact tracing that Michelle suggested? Yeah. Uh, definitely. And I think those principles are really fundamental. And that's why I pointed out Newark and Immokalee. Um, and, you know, those are being really led by people in the community. Partners in Health is helping, but we are not doing it. Um, and so I think those principles, the metrics, how they look, um, how they're connected with care is really um, you know, and I just went down to Newark last week to meet with the um, head of the Department of Public Health and the team there. And, you know, these are, you know, people who live in Newark, work in Newark. The mayor is from Newark, uh, as you know, the son of Amiri Baraka. Uh, and is, you know, the, his, uh, Mayor Baraka's lead um, discussion whenever he does a Facebook Live uh, or any discussion about the pandemic is we have to do this because I care about you, because we care about each other. Um, and also he talks about redlining. He talks about the exclusion of Newark from other resources and why it will be harder on the people of Newark. So I think there's a lot of leadership from particularly the black community uh, in cities um, and, and communities around the world. Uh, with Immokalee, it's interesting because the majority of the folks in Immokalee who we're working with are undocumented. And so the fact that they are taking leadership of the situation, um, despite the huge political risks and a government that completely denies their human humanity uh, is really remarkable. So yes, I, I, I certainly can. 
And I, I think just just to follow up on that, it's it, it sounds. I mean, it's to me, it sounds like those are places where the roots and the principles are already there. And I think the big question in my mind is, you know, what would the public health department's response be? Since so much of contact tracing is also kind of, you know, again, sharing that data back with the public health department for all of the reasons that we know very well. Um, and so is there a negotiation? Is there a compromise? What, what could it look like for communities to um, do the contact tracing, lead it, uh, you know, figure out the metrics that are most important to them, and then still somehow fulfill some of the requirements that public health departments are demanding. Um, and we understand why, right? I mean, I'm not saying that those demands are inappropriate. I'm just saying that they certainly advance a surveillance state that many communities are not willing to be a part of. And it's probably a big part of the reason why some contact tracing programs are not effective, right? Um, so, so just wondering what that compromise dialogue and, and back and forth would look like. And to follow up on that, Michelle, since you are now immersed in the belly of the beast in Washington, D.C., are there discussions or could you imagine a set of reforms that the federal government could undertake such that it might possibly win back any kind of trust so that a community like the ones that Joy described could imagine engaging with the federal government response? It's such uh, yeah, I lose sleep on, on that question every night, <laughs> and I'm glad you asked it. I'm curious to hear what others think as well, because I know lots of folks in this conversation have engaged in policy and federal government stuff. Um, I think from my perspective, of course, it, I mean, it's not possible under the current administration, for sure, but in future administrations, perhaps. And I think it would, I mean, there are lots of ways that that work could start. There's so much to be learned from other countries that have successfully advanced uh, truth and reconciliation um, yeah. programs, projects, conversations, etc. Um, reparations, to Joya's point, would be a great starting point, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what better way to build that trust than to, again, acknowledge, redress, and, and find closure. Um, and so I, I think that it would be really uh, meaningful to federal government would finally step up to the plate and admit that reparations are required. What I'm seeing, I don't know if you all are seeing this, but what I'm seeing on the Hill also is lots of uh, companies from JP Morgan to, you know, others on the S&P at the top of the S&P 500 are actually making commitments uh, for reparations. 30, I think it was JP Morgan, I want to say that committed $30 billion to reparations, what they're calling reparations initiatives, whether they're truly reparations initiatives or not, I'm not sure, but they're doing it because they see a business case for reparations. They see actually like increasing black wealth as a way for them to make more money. And so they think that the racial wealth Wealth gap is actually a problem for their capitalist endeavors and are putting money forward to try to fix it. So that's a whole nother conversation. That's not the kind of reparations I'm talking about. I'm talking about federal government reparations, but I, 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 that would be a great place to start in terms of building trust. Yep. But I also think that that is why we have to critique the um, the way knowledge is created about health and public health, because, you know, the critique is just wrong. So who would trust it? I mean, I, I think we've set ourselves up to just be not credible at all. And I mean, my feeling about this really started when I started working in Africa years ago and seeing children that were starving. And my job was to teach the moms how to feed their kids. I was 25 years old. I didn't know anything about feeding a kid. These moms knew everything. Jean-Claude talks about this very eloquently. But that is a completely flawed pedagogy. Of, of what's wrong, you know, what Paul always says is the cognitivist, you know, but that is because of racism and we have to name it so we can deconstruct it and reconstruct something better. Okay, so if it's okay, now I will raise my hand and ask something. Uh, Joy and Michelle, thank you so much. This was amazing. So um, I come from a country where um, I grew up in Rwanda. Most of you know we had historical events that really, I mean, it's a genocide, but operation of one group of the, 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 
one group of the population. After the genocide, what we had to reckon with was um, really to look at um, those who were left behind and oppressed and uh, try that type of reparation in all of aspects from education to creating funds for medical care and all of that without thinking um, in the ways that I observe since I came to the US uh, of people who really don't want, or a society that doesn't want to be apologetic for inventing the modern world. That's how some of the racist uh, rhetoric says it. Um, but in the meantime, as that modern world was being invented, it was on the blood and uh, oppression and exclusion of, of blacks and brown people. So I, 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 to you, Joya or Michelle, whoever, or whoever has thought about this, that denial to recon with that and really try to uplift, uh, is it you in this country because of the years, uh, decades that have passed? Uh, because this thing is not like happened uh, centuries ago, it continues up to today. Uh, I'm thinking maybe it happened in Rwanda, maybe because things were still fresh, but I would assume that's something every society has to start with, very con with that. Don't really feel like, oh, this is where we are. Let's take it from here, forget the past and go to the future. The future is almost impossible that way. What do you think is, uh, is fueling this resistance here? Is it the, the, the time or that has passed since? I don't understand it. Michelle, I'll let you go first. Oh, what a difficult one, <laughs> Jean-Claude. I mean, that's, um, I feel like the answer is just like, oh, the history of America. Yeah, I, I, I guess I, I don't have an answer, but just some things that come to mind for me as I'm like working through your question. It's such an important, such a powerful question. I think um, there is, uh, who was it that said that white supremacy is a bipartisan affair? I mean, I, I think it's, it's in the US both both political parties have really upheld white supremacy in ways that are just not um, talked about or acknowledged or uh, respected. And I think that that lack of willingness to actually speak the word and actually um, acknowledge the problem um, is is one of the reasons why we haven't seen the action, the reconciliation. Uh, but I do think part of the forced reckoning that we're seeing right now um, and the work that activists and organizers across the country have done around taking down from Confederate statues, for example, um, and, and things like that, kind of taking down um, and, and rethinking or bringing light to these symbols uh, of, of white supremacy and the symbols that have erased the, uh, and prevented the reckoning that you're talking about um, is one of the ways that that reckoning again is being forced. It's, it's because it's not happening um, and there's not a uh, mainstream willingness for that uh, conversation to happen or for a, a reckoning to happen, it's being forced in ways that some people see as violent, others see as justice, uh, depending what <laughs> kind of which side you're on. Similarly, I mean, I guess I'll just, the last thing I'll mention is um, just looking at uh, what happened at Brigham in the past couple of years, there was a deep, deep division uh, about whether or not the photos, the painted photos of all of the department chairs and division chiefs at Brigham, who are mostly white men, whether or not those should be taken down off of one of the main auditoriums in Brigham or not. And the current president of Brigham pushed forward an initiative to take those uh, uh, portraits down, but there was fierce, fierce resistance. And, and I'm not saying that that is enough racial reckoning or that that is, uh, you know, that represents the kind of reckoning that you're talking about, Jean-Claude, or, or the kind of reckoning uh, and reconciliation that happened in Rwanda. But again, there's just such um, divided thinking um, about what the history of this country actually is, uh, that it makes it very hard for any reckoning to happen, except when it's violent and forced. And I cannot add to anything you have said, uh, Michelle. I want to say, though, that I think we are all as academics complicit 
you know, because we have some power. And if we don't critique the very artifice that that is creating this knowledge, I mean, that's why I put forward the idea of a, a you know, oppositional epistemology, because we are perpetuating these systems through our scholarship. And, you know, we should not be okay with a threefold mortality difference between black and white Americans. We should not, that should be a non-starter, that should be a crisis, that should be a house on fire crisis. But so should the fact that 24,000 children die a day from malnutrition who are black and brown. And so this is not like we are upholding it by studying around the margins um, and accepting the center. It looks like there's a question in the chat. The, uh, I apologize for mispronouncing this name, but if Demetris wants to ask directly, we can do that. Is that D? Demetris? So, so I'll just read the question then. It says, I'm, I'm from Georgia and across the belly of the state are some of the highest infant mortality rates. This area is right across the slave belt of the state. Yes. Do you think the artifacts of slavery are ingrained in the space and are manifesting in health disparities of the residents? Yes, thank you. I couldn't get my mute uh, unmuted in time. You, would, you, would you like to expand more on that? It's an important observation. Yeah, well, in Georgia, we have this so the belly is the part that kind of sticks out. And um, when we overlay the uh, infant mortality rates, they seem to be most dire right across the belly, which was also what we call our state slave belt. There was an intensification of uh, um, slavery as well as um, um, colonial uh, production activities in that area around those ag uh, regions in the middle of the state. And I think that, I, I'm not sure, that's why I'm asking. I wonder if, if it's ingrained, can space be infected sort of like a virus? And I'm sorry if my question- Oh, you are right. <laughs> I, 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 I just, I know there's a, a phenomenon called the pain body, but is there the similar with space? Can space be in pain? Yes, absolutely. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, Demetrius. The, what a phenomenal observation. And your answer is yes. Um, did some work with the Equal Justice Initiative in, um, in Alabama. And they had many children, for example, in the Black Belt area, which was where the Black soil was, ergo also where there was so much, so many enslaved people. Um, then of course, after emancipation, zero kind of economic support, many deaths, people stayed in those areas, even under threat often of terror, lynching. Um, and in this area, there were a bunch of children that had hookworm, which had been all but eradicated for the, from the United States. And when the doctors who were white found the hookworm and the children who were black, they wanted to put the moms in prison for neglecting their children. Um, and the, what happened was that because in these very poor areas, there is no public municipal sanitation. And in fact, people still in many places had outhouses and still uh, were using septic uh, systems that were very outdated and very expensive to repair, then there was hookworm there. So the hookworm wasn't the problem, right? The historical problem of oppression, lack of land ownership, lack of a public institution. This is why I pointed out the failure of institutions um, in communities of color. Um, leading to an illness hookworm, which some historians have connected with the South losing the Civil War, um, that is depleting, that causes anemia, that causes sickness. This is just one example of sickness in the soil, sickness in the body, sickness in our politics. And to me, this is really a very central uh, example of necropolitics. And then the incarceration of people for being poor. 
Oh, thank you. That was so wonderful. But let's look at the belly of Georgia together. I'm, I'm I would I'm, love to. Let's do it. Let's do it. To. Yep, let's do it. Oh, Maxo had a question from Liberia. Hi, Maxo. Welcome back to Africa. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you, um, Julia. And I wanted also to take this opportunity to thank the entire panel for such a beautiful and deep and terrific uh, conversation. Um, I have a, one or two questions for the, for the panel. Um, the first one is that, you know, um, for following this beautiful conversation, it seems like we, we, we do have a fair understanding, if I'm allowed to say that, of what the work causes, of what we've been observing for like decades. Um, now, what is it? we are all ready to do in order to uh, to change the narrative, given that we know pretty much the root causes of this. And the second one is that somehow there has been always, you know, uh, some political component in everything we've been observing. Um, let's say if you take the, you know, the, uh, the disparity in health outcomes between, you know, black and colored and white people everywhere. Um, what is it we need to do in order actually to change uh, the, the narrative? We totally know that, for example, black people just or what they like calling us the visible minority because we are so visible and all kind of, you know, um, you know, poor health outcomes. Um, what can we do to change the narrative to bring people, um, black people in color to a point where they can, again, we can trust in the health system because even where there will be accessibility, Although uh, it seems to be very far from getting there, um, still they will not, you know, trust the system actually to access whatever is available. And I've seen that also in Canada, where despite you know whatever we think the health system is in Canada, you have a group of people who normally don't access, although it's available. Uh, just because they just don't trust the system. Um, the system, when they were designing it, um, the beneficiaries of such system, they were a part of the of the design. So as a result, they just don't use it. They don't access it. This is an example of First Nations. They design a system that is not theirs. So what is it now that I think the government of Canada is realizing that they are trying actually to rethink the way they do business by trying to teach, you know, first and second year med school students how to do a better job by inviting those, you know, First Nation community dwellers, um, what they would like to see happen in order to make the health system what that uh, will, will will be considered as a friendly system for them to use. So um, having said so, I will stop there and hear your, your thoughts around, around that. Thank you. Over back to you. Great. I can, um, I can just Go throw ahead. out a couple quick thoughts and Joy, Joya, please jump right in. Thank you for that. Beautiful, beautiful uh, reflection and question, Max. So I think it's that is like that is the heart of it. And it and and I I just I I go back to of course kind of self determination and autonomy uh, as such critical and important principles uh, as part of the response to your question. I also it made me immediately also think about uh, necropolitics again. And at at the end of the book, um, Mbembe talks a little bit about how 
Europe has always been this place that we look to for solutions and answers uh, to questions like the question that you're posing. And I just want to read something from it because I think it really captures a lot of uh, what I see as kind of a partial answer to your question. And, and so Mbembe says that Europe, which has given so much to the world and taken so much in return, often by force and by ruse, is no longer the world's center of gravity. No longer is Europe that place over there to where we must go to find the solutions to the questions we have posed over here. It is no longer the pharmacy of the world. Um, and he, he talks about that as just, a, you know, again, like a, a shift, an ideological shift, certainly, but a shift in um, what is valued and, and in the story of self, right? How we tell our own stories and, and who gets to tell our story for us. Um, so I, I, that's, that's a little bit of a, um, a not direct answer to your question, but that's, that's what your question made me think about. I also just want to add to that, that, you know, when we look, uh, Maxo, as I know you have, at how well Rwanda and even Liberia, a much, much poorer country, is doing, that we see that uh, against COVID versus the United States disaster, is that we see that even in impoverishment, there, there are principles of equity. Uh, and principles of leadership for the benefit of the population. And so what we're missing is not tech, you know, know-how, it's not the moral underpinnings, but is money. So I think we need to continue to fight for reparations. Um, you know, there's, there are at least 10 articles I saw about, wow, why is Africa doing so well against COVID? Well, you know, there are countries that have a lot of leadership for health and have put equity in the center of the response. And so it's not all, but uh, I think we need money. And it's money that's owed. That's the thing. It's money that it's owed. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I have a question, if that's okay. Yes, go ahead, Anayi. <laughs> Hi, Joya. Thank you so much, Michelle and Joya, for this wonderful talk. Definitely calls for um, deep introspection and, and thought. And um, I'm thinking about the, uh, specifically about the feminist movement in Mexico. Um, you know, I'm from Mexico and I'm a country that um, has been, um, witnessing the the murder of women all around the country um many times by the by the hand of the state and um this this is kind of the base of the feminist movement and right now it has been i think portrayed and especially i think by the government as a um they obviously they they um advocate for abortion rights and for um health for reproductive health rights for women, but I think that the government has used that um, screen to kind of um, label them uh, as, um, you know, whatever you want to call them that they have called them already, violent and um, et cetera, et cetera. So how can a movement like this overcome um, the labels and the, Im I think that uh, the image that has been portrayed of them in the country, um, because they've been just um, labeled by by their um, fight towards abortion, where that's I mean, although they are advocating for that right and, and it's essential, the movement is just so it's 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 based on so much more, and it's like putting the health um, and the right the dignity of women above, and just bring um, and you know just it, it's about it's about um, equity, but but they I think that they have been portrayed as just this tiny tiny piece of the movement. Um, which has been really, has negative consequences um, of their, yeah, of their, in their movement, I think, in their progress. Michelle, do you wanna? As, um, as you were speaking, I, I'm not sure I have a, a, a response or a clear answer, but as you were speaking, I was reflecting on how much I learned from, 
the, the protest chant that women in Chile started, but that has been used all over the world now, um, a rapist in your path and, and talks about patriarchy as a state, <laughs> uh, uh, a state in, in uh, state supported, state propagated rape of women, um, and just how to me that framework uh, and that framing of that of the feminist movement um, in its current form is so expansive uh, because it calls out. It's not about abortion, <laughs> right? It's not about abortion rights only. It is about patriarchy ingrained in the policies of the state over and over and over again in every aspect and in every way. And it's such an expansive framework um, that really, again, it, it's feminist, but it, it truly makes that connection between state oppression um, and patriarchy in a way that uh, nothing else I've, I've, I've read really does. So I, I, that's what I was immediately thinking of, of just how expansive that uh, framing of the problem is. Yeah. There's also a question I saw that Paul has put in. If, if there is a radical autonomy in public health interventions, what mechanisms beyond reparations might funnel back the resources drained from some communities and siphoned to others, places like Imolake? Imolake. So mm -hmm. thanks, Paul. I mean, that is a, that's a good question, of course. Always is the question, how do we pay for it? Um, and I think we just you know, also need a radical rethinking of what our public contract looks like in the United States. Uh, Florida, where Immokalee is based, or, or Immokalee is in the state of Florida, is one of only 12 countries that has not expanded Medicaid for the ACA. And that's not an accident. That is purposely to leave out people of color, particularly immigrants. Um, and so I think the electoral process voting and thinking of ways to hold our elected officials accountable for maintaining a public contract is a critical part of the work. Uh, you know, obviously reparations is a critical aspect that we're always thinking about, but there are so many ways that we could be funding interventions into communities. Um, the other is the CARES Act. So we have worked on legislation uh, and our team has worked on it, uh, uh, but many have uh, to try to get money into the hands of poor people right now in the COVID disaster and into states. And yet that money is not getting to the ground. So I think, again, trying to understand the flows of capital, who controls the money, and how we can hold people accountable for the outcomes of that money with an agenda of equity and, and to um, repair harm. Uh, just got off the phone with Sheila and others about the work in Navajo and the CARES money that, you know, that hasn't, hasn't, that came to Arizona and New Mexico, et cetera, has not come to the Navajo nation. So, uh, you know, there, there is money, there are funds, but they're not being used to support the poorest, the most vulnerable, and certainly communities of color. So that is part of, I, and, and when you look at the demands of the movement, whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, whether it's a movement for sovereignty against pipeline, et cetera, there is a clear call for control over resources, right? Because if you don't control the resources, you can't, affect change. So mm -hmm. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and one other thought that came to mind for, for that question is um, some, some counties and cities are, are declaring racism a public health emergency, not as a PR you know, thing, but as a way to actually mobilize resources. Um, and some places are mobilizing those resources in a way where there is community autonomy and community ownership of the funds that are mobilized through the public health emergency declaration. It's not happening everywhere. Um, within our campaign, we have a working group that's actually looking at that quest question and writing a white paper, just analyzing how that uh, racism as a public health emergency policy framework is being used 
um, sometimes again for more uh, like, you know, just uh, a, a, a more of a PR thing, but in some places more for really a mobilization of resources and how those resources are then helping to um, uh, address the question around community autonomy and community ownership of resources for, um, for, uh, for independent community led work. And, you know, some of the discussions around defunding the police are about refunding <laughs> uh, other things like public education, like systems of care, so uh -huh. community organizations. Well, um, Joya, Michelle, thank you. You know, I, um, we're at the, we're at the uh, end of our time together, but I want to say on behalf of David and Paul and all of us and, and people on the curriculum committee like Joya and others that you know, our goal with this series has been to really look at how context, you know, social history and political economy and social theory, the tools that we think about, can be brought together uh, to, to really improve the way we're doing uh, global health delivery and the way we're understanding social medicine. And I can't think of just a better talk than what Professor Joy Mukherjee and Professor Michelle Morse have just done, because we've actually seen how all three of those pieces come together and, and kind of force us, urge us to think, think differently. So thank you both for just such an amazing uh, talk and thank you everyone for such great participation. Um, I wanna say next week, uh, so we're, you know, we're not, we, we, in the past we've taken a two week break, but we're not taking a two week break this time. Next week, so a week from today, uh, we're gonna have David Jones uh, who introduced uh, uh, Joy and Michelle today uh, and he, he's, he's, a, uh, um, he's an author of a, fant a number of books, but a fantastic book called uh, Rationalizing Epidemics, uh, Meanings and Uses of American Indian Mortality Since 1600. And he'll be joined by Nancy Oriel, who's the founder of The Family Band, who has actually spent her entire career uh, working on ensuring that health is delivered in communities that have really been dispossessed. And they're going to talk about historical perspectives on race and disease. It's really picking up from a great foundation that uh, Alan Brandt and Paul Farmer and now Joya Mukherjee and Michelle Morse have laid for us. So we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week at 12 o'clock. And thank you again for a great, great talks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so thanks much. Everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Thank Michelle you. and Joya, if you want to stay to take more conversations, please feel free to. And then those that want to, you know, uh, go off uh, to their respective tasks can do that. I'm going to put, I have to run, but I'm going to put my email in case folks want to follow up. Okay, great. Yeah, I can stay a little bit longer. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I actually have to switch over to, uh, to, a, to a grad student section for another course. Joya, do you mind if I make you the host? No, that's um, fine. So that you can end it. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, probably most people have to run, I would imagine. Okay. <laughs>